um, objective is, let's assume arguendo, it's 11 million. The first objective is to make sure the number 11 million doesn't go up. If there are 11, people who are un 11 million people who are undocumented in this country, I think obligation number one to us as a country is make sure that number doesn't go up, which means border security, and by the way, we have two borders, and interior security. Over half the people who are not here legally didn't cross any border. We invited them here. They just didn't leave when they were supposed to leave. So make sure the 11 million doesn't go up. Border security, interior security. That, that is not an immigration issue, that's a national security issue. I don't think a sovereign country should have to apologize for knowing who is coming and going from its country. So security number one. Number two, number two, with the 11 million, you have to come forward. You have to let us know who you are. And if you cannot pass a background check, one of the problems with the Senate bill is you could have committed an act of domestic violence, which South Carolina, by the way, leads the nation in, in men killing women. You could commit an act of domestic violence and still, still be on the path to citizenship. So, no, I'm not going to support that. I will support a rigorous background check. And, and I need to know that you are willing to assimilate. You don't have to become uniform, but you have to assimilate into our values. So with the 11 million, make sure the number doesn't go up. Border security, interior security. Pass a background check. You have to come forward. If you have been convicted of a crime, you have forfeited your right to stay in this country. And then get countries who will not take back their foreign nationals to take them back or cut off the foreign aid. You would be stunned at the number of countries who will not take back their foreign nationals that we want to deport because of some removal proceeding. So security first, then we'll deal with the 11 million. I am fine with the path to legal status, but I am not gonna jump people ahead of others who have waited in line and done it the way this country asked them to do it. I'm just not gonna jump them ahead of them. Our country's immigration system is broken. Our laws are not being enforced and most Americans are wary of the so-called reforms coming out of Washington. For nearly 30 years, Americans have been promised a secure border and an immigration system that works for all Americans. Those promises have not been kept and both political parties bear responsibility for that. Right now, the President of the United States is able to shut down the enforcement of some of our immigration laws because he does not like those laws. Never mind that he took an oath to faithfully execute the law. Never mind that you have to follow all laws whether you agree with them or not. And never mind that respect for and adherence to the law is the bedrock of a functioning democracy. As we move toward an immigration system that works for all Americans and a system worthy of your respect, we should keep in mind the primary function of government is the safety and security of the American people. That is true on the national level with national defense. It is true on the state and local level with law enforcement and police officers. The House Judiciary Committee is considering a bill introduced to strengthen the interior enforcement of our immigration laws by allowing state and local governments to enforce federal immigration law. In doing so, we remove the ability of this or future presidents of either party to systematically shut down portions of the law to suit their political purposes. In addition, we embrace the reality that many people currently in the country unlawfully did not cross any border. Rather, they were invited into our country through a visa and did not leave when required to by law. I want you to keep something in mind as we consider allowing state and local law enforcement to assist our federal ICE officers in enforcing our immigration laws and preserving the safety and security of our border and our interior. We trust state and local law enforcement officers to enforce every category of law, from murder to child sex cases to narcotics trafficking. Who do we call when we hear noises outside of our house in the middle of the night? Who do we trust when the sanctity of our homes is violated or our personal property is stolen or damaged? Who do we trust when it comes to investigating crimes involving children, the elderly, those who cannot speak up for themselves because of age or infirmity? Who patrols our local streets and provides security at our schools? Who do members of Congress, for that matter, call when they are in their districts and they need security for a town hall or a public event? State and local law enforcement. 
That's who we call. If we trust them to do all of that, if we trust them with every category of crime and enforcement, surely we should give them a role in enforcing our country's immigration laws. To learn more about this bill, visit judiciary.house.gov. Is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the issue in this case actually implicates the very existence of the House. The law is the reason we exist. We do not exist to uh, pass ideas or to pass suggestions. Uh, we make law with the corresponding expectation that that law will be enforced, respected, and executed. And we do so because the law is the thread that holds the tapestry of this country Together, it is the most unifying, equalizing force that we have. It makes the rich respect the poor. It allows the powerless to challenge the powerful. And attempts to undermine the law, Mr. Speaker, regardless of motivation, are detrimental to the social order. In 2014, President Obama declared unilaterally that almost 5 million unlawful immigrants would receive deferred action under some torture definition of prosecutorial discretion. I can't help but note the word discretion means sometimes you say yes and sometimes you say no, but of course, the administration has never said no. The court found not a single time has the administration said no, so that's not prosecutorial discretion, Mr. Speaker. That's lawlessness. And you may like what the president did. I take it from some of the speakers that they do. And you may actually wish what the president did was, was actually law. I can't, you may wish. Mr. Speaker, you may wish that when Democrats controlled the House, the Senate, and the White House for two years, that they had lifted a finger to do a single solitary thing about what they're talking about this morning. You may wish that. You may wish that all these grandiose policies that we are talking about this morning on the other side, that they cared enough about to actually make law when they had a chance, but they did not. And they know now that one person doesn't make the law in a republic. Uh, you may want to live in a country where one person makes the law, but that would not be this country. You would have to look for another one. And the president knows this because more than 20 times, Mr. Speaker, he said he could not do the very thing that he eventually did. His power didn't change. The law didn't change. The politics is all that changed. And we should have seen this coming, Mr. Speaker. He warned us on this very floor. He warned us that he didn't need the people's house. He said he'd do it with or without Congress, and many of you cheered when he said that. Many of you cheered because you benefit from the non-enforcement of the law today. But tomorrow will be different. Tomorrow is coming, and tomorrow will be different. Tomorrow you will cry out for the enforcement of the law. Tomorrow you will want others to follow the law. We are here, Mr. Speaker, because this administration violated one law in its haste to allow others to violate yet another law. The administration lost, and then they appealed. So here we are before the Supreme Court. For Mr. Speaker, Congress has let the executive branch engage in constitutional adverse possession. Today it's immigration. Tomorrow it will be some other law. And one day, I say to my friends on the other side of the aisle, one day... Your party may not control the gears of enforcement. One day a Republican president might decide that he or she doesn't like a law and is going to ignore it and fail to enforce it. For more than two centuries, Mr. Speaker, the law has been more important than any political issue. It's been more important than any election. It's been more important, frankly, than any one of us. It binds us together and it embodies the virtues that we cherish, like fairness and equality and justice and mercy and we symbolize our devotion to the law with this blindfolded woman holding a set of scales and a sword and that blindfold keeps her focus on the law but i want you to understand this mr speaker once that blindfold slips off it's gone forever you can want to put it back on but it is gone together because once you weaken the law Good luck putting it back together. So once you decide that some laws are worth enforcing and some are not, once you decide that some laws are worth following and others are not, 
You've weakened this thing we call the law, and you have weakened it forever. Let me just tell you this. I'll say this, Mr. Speaker. It doesn't take any courage to follow a law you like. That doesn't take any courage. Follow a law you like. What takes courage, which makes us different, is we follow laws even that we don't like. And then we strive to change them legally. That is the power and the fragility of the law. But once it is abandoned, it is weakened in the eyes of we expect to follow it. I'll say this, Mr. Speaker, in conclusion, in the oath of citizenship that we require new citizens to take, could I have 45 more seconds? Give the gentleman two minutes. The gentleman is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the oath of citizenship that we require new citizens to take, and I'm sure the speaker already knows this, and perhaps some of my colleagues on the other side may know this as well, but in that oath, it references the law five separate times. Five separate references to this thing we call the law in the very oath that we want new citizens to take. Five times in a single paragraph. Mr. Speaker, good luck explaining why new citizens should follow the law when those in power do not have to. Good luck explaining the difference between anarchy and the wholesale failure to enforce a law simply because you do not like it. Good luck stopping the next president from ignoring a law that he or she does not like. If the president can pick and choose which laws he likes, then so can the rest of us. And you have undermined the very thing that binds us together. So be careful what you do today. Tomorrow is coming. With that, I would yield back. Gentlemen,